Hi, everybody, and a very happy new year from us at Tough to Treat. This is Susan Clinton, one of your co-hosts for the podcast. Today, we're featuring podcast number 144, which is part two of the workshop that Erica and I did. In this particular part of the podcast, you're going to be listening to a couple of case stories. One is about a pregnancy postpartum case, and the other is about a softball player with shoulder pain. Go back and listen to part one if you missed it, because it'll really help you understand what we're doing in part two. For those of you who would like the slides, please join us at www.toughtotreat.com forward slash slides. That will take you to a landing page where we're going to grab your email from you so we can keep you in our our world. But we'll also, for, for giving us your email, we will give you a copy of our slides for these two podcasts. Enjoy the podcast and we will see you live next time. Thank you so much. So uh, she has fear. So what I found, this is what I found, fear with movement due to any open chain hip flexion and adduction, but has full range of motion, okay? Her hip moves well, but she doesn't want, she's not willing to stand and bend her knee up high. You know, that open chain kind of movement. Bend overs increase the pain um, in her back. Uh, standing on her left lower extremity is difficult to do. She doesn't cope with load transfer very well on that side. Um, she's able to move on the bed, get in and out of bed without issues, which is interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of people with pelvic girdle pain in pregnancy. That's the one thing they complain about. So yeah. she's not fitting the pattern recognition here. You know, she's yeah. not fitting the typical, oh, they can't move in bed and every, the, you know, transitional movements. She's, she doesn't like bend over. She can stand on one leg, but it's difficult. It doesn't cause her increased pain. She can sit on a chair and bend at the hips fully. Hmm. right so her hips are bending hmm. fine yeah you know but she you know so and then um climbing on stairs can increase the pain so when she has to really like uh load open chain yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. open open chain and then loading and open loading. chain and loading yeah and Got so it. anything else you would look at i just you know oh for me um no i mean i would maybe do the same thing i think that uh uh maybe i mean I'll squat, but uh, you know, I, the bend overs is the, pretty much the same thing. Um, the standing, I often find with hip patients that standing on on that one legged stance is really hard for these people. And sometimes I'll have them do um, like a little squat. I call that like chicken legs, where they get in a squat and they, and, and this is this is for people who are not really um, uh, sensitive or flared up uh, or irritable, so to speak. You know, you can get them in a squat, do internal external rotation, standing mm-hmm. if, if they're afraid to do that. Right. Um, that's more fear-based, um, mm-hmm. which it sounds like she has a lot of. But uh, uh, that's that's I would do the same, you know. But I love the squat. Yeah, fantastic. Because of the hip flexion, AD deduction, you know, part of me was like, I want to get her into braided walking right away, right away, and see what she's doing. But this was enough with her that first day. Trust me, with all the yeah. tears and everything else going on, it was like we got to figure out some things she can do right away that aren't going to cause her problems. And we have to debunk a couple of myths in here, mm-hmm. but only through movement for her, so she won't be afraid of them. Yes, yes, it's interesting. You, I know you should say can sit on the chair and bend in the hips fully. So if she can sit on a chair, she should be able to squat pretty, pretty yeah. okay, right? Yeah. So exactly. So, right. Yeah, and I think for yeah. hip patients, <clears throat> standing on that leg is so hard to do. Mm-hmm. It really is. Um, and she doesn't want to get on the floor because that bothers her. She doesn't yeah. want to sit, uh, you know, cross-legged on the floor. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. There we go. So um, her assessment, urinary health, uh, driven by a heavy schedule and, and avoiding time to void. Okay. Uh, nutrition was not optimal and doesn't take time for lunch at work. Um, we talked about her belief surgery, her belief system already, her poor expectations and worried about the future. And the movement and system impairments of load transfer and seated postures with full hip flexion and external ro- rotation. So that's down on the floor with the cross legs. Those are what I found. And what did we do? Well, we had a nice little discussion about urinary habits. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Taking time to go to the bathroom. And I just, I basically put it up to her. Now, if it was somebody else, I would have probably coached them a little bit more, or given them a little bit more patient education. She knew better. I just simply asked her what were her barriers and why was she doing that? Yeah. And I let her figure it out. And I said, what would be the best that you could do? She would say, go to the bathroom twice a day at work. And it's like, oh my okay. God. 
<laughs> can you can you make that happen? You know, there's a place to start. Take action. She could do it. Um, you know, because you you got to get your you know the the uh, normal sense of urge back. Yep. Yep. So we did some graded exposure and problem solving around seated postures for work. Remember, she could sit in a chair and bend over very easily. Yeah. And I said, how else could you sit to put on these compression bandages on your clients? And she finally said, I guess I could just stay on the rolling stool. And I said, well, let's give it a try. I hopped up on the high-low table. I let her grab the rolling stool. And I said, stuck my leg out and said, give it a whirl. See if it works. And then she kind of said, oh, all I need to do is just raise the table up higher. I was like, <laughs> you know, but we don't, this is what happened. These complex patients are not that complex. When you get down to the foundational pieces of what they can do, they, their world starts to change. We make them way too difficult and way too yes. uh, complicated, not to use the same it's, word. It's like com yeah, complex doesn't necessarily mean complicated, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's not complicated, like the commercial. But, you know, these were simple things. Go to the bathroom twice a day. You know, put yourself on a rolling stool and, you know, and so we can get you lower and lower. And we talked about kind of, you know, playing around with some stuff at home and, you know, sitting on a couple of blankets or, a, you know, a, a cushion was much more comfortable than sitting on the floor. It's like, let's, you know, you're just a little sensitive right now. Let's get this to kind of change and it'll, it'll be okay, you know, and then, um, you know, progressive low transfer exercises. Boy, did she need that on that left side. So we played around going up and down steps is, is, an, is not, uh, you know, is, she can't, she has to do it. Her bedroom's on the first floor and I mean on the second floor. And so is the baby's room going to be up there. Mm -hmm. Let's get yeah. that rolling and get it moving. And we worked on a lot of different ways. I did your like side, you know, squats and all the other different kinds of things. We eventually moved into a lot of braided walking because to kind of show her that she could do a deduction and mm -hmm. she could do a lift of the hip and up and over and those kinds of things she was worried about. And we eventually worked into some of that standing and rotation, you know, with the, pel the trunk on the hip. You know, mm -hmm. in the oh, back and yeah. yeah, and just really breaking up those movement patterns, giving her new ways to move and to think about moving differently mm -hmm. that she could incorporate into her day at work yes. to help her out. And then um, we started doing things like uh, cardiovascular exercise because she really, really was missing it and she really wanted to run, but it was, she just wasn't coping with the load transfer yet. Right. So we got her on the bike. She got, she could do the bike? Yeah. She had full flexion. I know, right? Yeah. I just said, and she looked at me crazy when I asked her about it. She goes, well, that's just going to make my hip hurt worse. And I said, well, what if you just got on there and see what happens? Yeah. You know, can you just do that? Get on, move the seat up and down a little bit, give it a whirl for five minutes, see how it feels. She was so excited to be on the bike. She was just, it was wonderful. So wow. she was able to get her heart rate up. She had her husband bring it into the house, put it on a trainer so she could get her heart rate up. And that just made her so happy. Nice. Her pain started going down immediately as soon wow. as she really started getting the cardiovascular stuff going. And then we started working on, you know, a graded walking program, you know, by dose by time and not by, you know, a half a mile. It was like, how far can you walk without pain? I don't know. Get out there and try it. Right. Right? Test, retest. We're like blowing yeah. hypotheses here. Like, you right. know, just try right. it. You know, walk outside. Go, you know, if you're worried, you know, how far do you think you can walk without pain? Well, I, can, I know I can walk like five minutes. And it's like, okay, go walk for five minutes and see how it feels. Yeah. Well, that seems so little. Well, then how far can you go? Well, probably 10. All right, whatever. We just bargain until she figured mm -hmm. it out. Yeah. And then she figured out that, you know, um, I actually could walk about 15, 20 minutes without it bothering me. So then she made a 10 minutes out, 10 minutes back kind of thing. And, and then we talked about, you know, how do we dose that? You know, if 10 minutes feels good, what's the next step? You know, and everybody always wants to say 20. <laughs> I know. Just double it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How can we confidently change, you know, increase your time without increasing your pain? You yeah. know, how can you have confidence for that? Yeah. And then she started kind of thinking about it. And she realized that maybe I should only go like two or three minutes more. And then we started adding in some sprints and some runs in there too, as she started to feel better. Cause we could do this over the distance here yep. you know, as her pregnancy was advancing and she was feeling so good and happy. Okay. Next slide. So the follow-up at five months of pregnancy, she was mostly pain-free. Remember we started at 11 weeks. 
Oh, um, okay. Yeah, she was able to walk three to four miles again, ride the bike for 30 minutes, and work with only minimal symptoms that seem to worsen if she is fatigued or stressed. How do you battle fatigue? Eat. <laughs> and go to the bathroom so that you're not up twice a night going, th right? And then, you know, when yeah. you're stressed, you know, kind of, so we talked about some self-management things with stress, you know, some breathing and some, you know, maybe even just a two-minute meditation, some things you could kind of pop in. But at least she recognized the relationship that her symptoms had with fatigue and with, you know, her response to stress. Yeah. Yeah. So that was good. Um, so now she knows what to do. You know, she, she, it's, not a, it's not a nebulous, I don't know what's going on. No one can fix me thing. It's like when I'm exhausted or when, I have a, you know, when I'm having a bad day, my, I definitely can feel the symptoms again. Yeah. You know, so uh, yeah. she, she, after her son was born, she came in to do some follow-up PT for mild uh, pelvic girdle pain with lifting and holding her son. So now it's shifted a little bit. We had a weight up here instead of out here. So we kind of did some of the same things. We problem solved. I actually gave her the floor and I said, let's let, you know, we remember how we did this before. Yeah, let's try some. So we try, I let her kind of like start to figure it out and try some things. I gave her some hints. We looked at movement and could feel it. Um, she wanted to work on grading increase of activities again and has been an avid consumer of understanding her condition and how all of the areas of her life affect her symptoms. So she's moving into her first year postpartum uh, with a much more healthy respect of fatigue, nutrition, going to the bathroom and grading her exercises and not trying to do all or nothing and yeah. not being afraid of things like stability, not feeling disabled and yeah. feeling lots of hope. So yeah. yeah. Not, not helpful, mm -hmm. those words. And you gave her choices. You gave her better choices, you know, whether it's physical. Yeah. Yeah, that was it was, you know, the, the, that in a nutshell, I know everybody out there is sitting there going, well, I don't know enough about nutrition or pelvic health or anything. It's just like, look, if somebody's going, you know, if you don't know, call one of us and ask us, we'll give you hints. Like the, the first thing I would say is <laughs> tell me about their avoiding habits. You make a tweak there, it probably clears it up at nighttime. Yeah. You know, there's people to reach out to, but the biggest thing is just look at them and just kind of hear their words work, you know, exhaustion. I'm not eating lunch. I'm not sleeping well. And I'm having all this pain and nobody can help it and nobody can fix it. And I imagine every, you know, I didn't even ask her how many times somebody tried to mobilize her pelvis, you know, or yeah. manipulate yeah. her SI joint or whatever you want to do. You know, it just, we just didn't even mess with that. It was like, her pelvis is fine. Yeah. She's just. <laughs> and that goes back to the questions, you know, and having the person tell you their story. Yeah. You found what was important to her. And that's what you, that's what you worked on. Did you, could you've gotten her, you know, focus on physical and working out and that was important to her. I mean, it was, but it was it, it, not as important. I mean, uh, right. I, I think. From what you're yeah, hearing. exactly. And at one point she even said, Oh, when I bend over and sitting on the stool like this, it's kind of like mobilizing my, my hip and pelvis. And it's like, sure. If it feels, you know, yeah, it is. It's mobilizing both of them, actually. Well, yeah, you know, so I said, you're just getting some good movement in and it feels comfortable to do it that way. So why not adopt that at work right now? Why keep pushing into the discomfort when you can be more comfortable? Exactly. And you'll be on, the, you know, and her thing was, well, then I'll never be on the floor. It's like, oh, yes, you will. <laughs> Great at exposure to movement, right? Cause, yeah, because we're going to keep moving you down until you feel more comfortable on the floor. But yes. for right now, tomorrow, wouldn't it be nice to go through your workday and not hurt? Yeah. <laughs> and it's a lot of it, you know, a lot of people in our field, when we get injured, um, we don't take care of ourselves well as physical therapists. I don't believe we do. I mean, as you, as I've gotten older, I've, I've done it more, but I think we don't, we just, and I've, as I said, I've had a ton of injuries. Yeah, we'll get better. I know better. We're the last people to take care of ourselves. Yep. But we so we have, we have a few minutes left. Let's get to your case study. Yes, we're moving. You know, we're good. We are good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, uh, we actually did a podcast on her. I don't remember exactly, I'm just looking at my notes here. I don't remember what, what episode. It was early on. Um, uh, it was a, an, a, 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 actually a softball player, I think the title was. So she uh, was referred to some, me by somebody out in the West Coast. She well, goes to school here. She had a lot of left arm pain. And uh, when she looked down and when she turned her head to the left, and she was a, a college softball player, and she was a catcher and a first baseman, so primarily a catcher, and then they moved them to first base on and off. So she had been treated for what she told me, sort of evidence-based for, you know, treatment for cervical radiculopathy, man, you know, manual and mechanical traction, 
probably some deep, deep, uh, deep, deep neck flexor, deep neck flexor work. And she basically said she was getting treated for herniated disc, but she had an MRI and she really wasn't, wasn't feeling much better. So her main issue was the left arm pain, a little bit of neck pain, um, going into the shoulder girdle and down to below her, below her elbow actually. And, uh, she just, she just really wanted to play softball. I mean, that was her thing. Okay, so she's actually right-handed, and you can see she needs to turn her head to the left to hit the ball. Uh, so uh, she didn't really play for many, many, many weeks, and I think this is she was very depressed, to be honest. She was a college student, and she was also pretty super flexible, pretty hypermobile, and what I, uh, for me, is once again, I need to assess a movement that's meaningful for her. She made it easy for me. I can't turn my head. I'm like, okay, let's look at, let's, let's look at you turn your head. Okay, let's not overthink this. Okay. Um, did I look at forward bending? Yes, but not, I didn't focus on that because once again, I tend to find in my practice, the driver or the driving influence or the region is generally the same across certain, certain, certain movement tasks. So what I've been doing lately is with, um, just quick on, on a virtual basis is I've been seeing the patient from the front virtually. And I know we talk about this on the podcast, looking at their eyes and things like that. So looking at the patient from the front, I challenge you to do this in the clinic. I know we all want to stand behind the patient, put our hands on their neck and feel their upper traps and what, they, you know, what, are they, what, what, what actually is mechanically happening. But looking at them from the front, if you have a mirror in the room or just go walking around the table and standing, has been an eye opener for me virtually because I'm screenshotting things, I'm seeing things that I would never glean from looking at the person from behind. Mm -hmm. You're looking at eye movement, jaw movement, you know, upper, upper, upper trunk movement. And I would tell, I would really have in the clinic, I'm gonna do this. You know, we don't have a mirror in, in every treatment room, so I will walk around and I may even take a few pictures, but, um, but I think this was very important and I saw her a while ago, so I didn't have that luxury, but I will tell you that, I'm just gonna move on to the next slide. Oops, sorry. Um, we all know when you turn your head to the left, what happens? I'm not gonna go into the whole biomechanical thing. Things should just turn to the left, okay? And on this, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, graphic on the upper right-hand side, what I did find was, I found that she had a lot of arm pain at about 20 degrees of rotation. And, you know, once again, I'm not going to say the word normal because normal is different for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, when she turned her head to the left, she also had this, uh, this translation in her upper thorax. So she was turning and she was doing this to try to get more rotation. So if you have this, um, and I think it's because of her softball playing, if you have a lot of, of, of uh, I don't want to use the word twist, but some, some neuromuscular holding pattern in that upper left and under in the axilla and you're turning your head and you, you can't really turn it much farther. So what she ended up doing, which was so obvious, she just went like this. She would depress her shoulder girdle, excuse me, she would down, dump her downwardly rotate her scapula and she would retract. And she would do that every single time she turned her head. She probably did a little, you know, side bending, things like that. But, but ultimately she couldn't turn and she needed to. So she was just doing this, doing this the whole time. I don't know if you could see my shoulder, but, mm -hmm. you know, dumping, depressing, retracting her scapula every time. So just one note, if someone has had um, a clavicular fra fracture or anything in there that's trauma to the clavicle, I would have looked at that a bit more, okay? Just because it, it may have been in her picture. But in my practice, I don't tend to see a lot of neck pain driven from the clavicle, okay? But I'm just sort of throwing that out there in case there's been, there's been, there's been some trauma. So basically she took the path of least resistance and she turned her head, or she rotated her shoulder blade. That's why in that arrow up there, you can see that, that, that little arrow. So you're gonna see that those upper ribs translate to the left. And I know it's a bit biomechanical, so just, just bear with me. So what I ended up doing, because the first thing that I saw was that, that, that shoulder blade, that dumped shoulder blade, um, in the clinic, what I had her do is I literally just put my hands under her shoulder in the axilla, have her, you know, sort of shrug up and just relax her shoulder blade and have her turn. And once again, yes, I know I'm offloading a lot of structures in the neck. Um, and she was able to turn pretty much full, but she still had a little bit of pain at the end range of rotation. So you can talk about modifying, correcting, 
Uh, ultimately, you're changing the neurophysiological input to the system. You can call it whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. uh, you just need to find the way in. That's it. Whether it's, you know, it, it's different with everybody. And in the virtual setting, I'm using obviously more cueing. So when we talk about imagery a lot on the podcast, I tell her to float her shoulder blades, I'll let, letting go of the scapula. And I think there's been some research about intrinsic versus extrinsic cueing. I don't remember exactly uh, where I heard that, but uh, in more intrinsic, you know, intrinsic to versus like squeeze your shoulder blades, put your feet on the ground versus float float your scapula, just let it go. Cues that will make sense to the patient. And I know you do this a lot with breath, mm -hmm. you know, you know, breathe through your bra strap. That's another way in the virtual setting to modify their, 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 their position or get, find the way in or, or, or just get into uh, change neurophysiological input. Mm -hmm. So when I did that, um, she literally had full range of motion. Okay. And I really focused on, on, on left rotation. Are you okay? Should I just keep moving on here? Yeah, you're good. No, the only thing that I would add in there is that as you're coming under with her, you kind of came under the scapula into the, the axilla, right? Yes. To just lift and support, you know, yes. and you do this at home a lot and you do this in your clinic a lot too. And I use it too. I usually grab a couple of washcloths and just set them up in there. Yes. Yes. That's you know, and if you can at home, you know, if they're at home, they can go grab some washcloths and some towels. And we use a lot of that kind of fun stuff to, to position yes. but basically are you just talk about like pretend like there's water balloons in there so you're moving it from an external cue which is that intrinsic cue to an intrinsic or an internal cue yes. so that they can actually tap into it uh through their central nervous system rather than needing an external cue sometimes we have to start externally but then as quickly as possible for motor control we need it to be intrinsic you know and that's what you're doing there with the with the visioning and the breathing and whatever else, you know, the other things that you can have and then adding the head turn so that they can actually see, oh, when I do this, then I can actually turn my head. Exactly. And I, yes, the washcloth is great. Sometimes I will have little balls as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I, that's a great idea, especially virtually. And um, moving on. So this is a sort of a, a lot of going on on this slide. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time. But the main reason, you know, was it just a scapula? No, of course not. Um, it, it, the common pattern that I see is uh, a lot of holding pattern up and through here into the, into, into the scapula. There are certain muscles that we call, you know, are compensatory. And I believe in this particular patient, every time she dumped her scapula, you know, she overworked her rhomboids, her middle traps, and, 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 and can you go in and, and, and sit there and do whatever you want to do soft tissue wise, whatever we do, however you do that. Um, you can. Um, I think they're compensatory, and I don't think it would have been an efficient use of my time. Uh, and there are many ways that you, you can release muscles. I do more active work now, uh, more, much more than, than passive. But uh, these were, 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 were compensatory, and, and, and it would not have helped her. So uh, the common pattern I see are you know, intercostal, serratus, subscapularis, a lot of muscles that tend to grip in through here. And those are common patterns that I see. And although her neck was her pain generator, her drivers were really the loss of control in her upper upper thorax, as well as the poor scap control. I mean, you just keep, she just keeps doing this with her shoulder blade all day long. She's just going to keep getting what she always got. That's pain and dysfunction. So we need to change. We need to change her motor map. We need to change her brain and give her another strategy. So that I'll talk about this in the next few slides. So this is these are just common patterns I see uh, in 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 my clinic. It's almost like you need to delink. The two. I don't like to use that word, but de-link and sort of give her a little bit more space in through here, which is what I did. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so this is uh, not her, <laughs> but uh, what worked with her. I did do some manual therapy. Obviously, I did some release work. I did, once again, more dynamic work than, than passive at this point in my career. I do a lot more active work. Um, you just want to get her into a position that's going to engage those muscles, that's going to engage for her the serratus, the intercostals, her subscap. You know, when she's doing a movement, which, you know, have her turn her head in standing and have her squat because that's functional. Squat, have her turn her head, start to release those muscles and those functional movement patterns that are really, and they're meaningful for her. Head rotation is meaningful. Squatting is meaningful. She's a catcher. She has to squat. So, and once again, you know, these are these, these compensatory muscles. So what I find is that a common deficit um, with these types of patients is they have a, a weakness in some push muscles. And 
these push muscles tend to be triceps, you know, some chest, some, some abdominals. And this is just, once again, scapular tape. Basically how I um, modified, I just had her unload her, unload, her, unload her shoulder girdle and I just taped it up with some Luca tape and, um, and hypofix. And we talk a lot about, we talk a lot about on the podcast, contextual and changing and changing the environment. So with her, I, I believe that we need to, you know, do exercise in, 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 in phases or tiers, whatever you want to call them. And I didn't want to sit here and have her turn her head. I mean, she had her neck treated and it wasn't getting better. So I knew that, that, you know, in hindsight, that, that she would have left the practice if I started treating her neck and she didn't have a great, this is the belief. I believe that the, my neck treatment didn't get better. Okay, well, why would I treat her neck? Number one, it wasn't, wasn't her, it wasn't the cause of her problem. So I had her get on all fours, had her turn her head. You could also, what you could do there is throw a TheraBand around her forearms. Be really nice to give her some scap, scap stabilization through there. Um, love these, this pose here. I believe this is triangle pose in yoga. Um, turning her head to the left in a different context, elongating through here. Um, once those, mm -hmm. those, those, those holding patterns are, are, are loose, or not loose, are, have been let go, uh, you need to train the movement and, and she could do once again, float your shoulder blade, do some breath work with, with movement. And same thing here. You could have her get on her, you know, on all fours and, and you could also just have her, you know, looking, she can look down, looking down was an issue for her. Right. So, uh, what I found typically in these patients as well is that the lats tend to be very, very stiff um, and tend to be a muscle that needs to let go. And this is, uh, you can do a child's pose. I tend to start with like um, doing a down dog on the wall and then doing one on the table and then going into the floor. Uh, and then you can, you can have her do some, some rotation here. But I, I, this is another a good one to do for, for people. Um, and, and I did this with her actually. Yeah, I like this one, and especially because if they can't, if their lats are over recruiting, you can actually put them put blocks up under their hands yes. or books against the wall and have them put their hands up so they don't have to go so far down. And you can just, you know, alter that kind of position a bit to meet them where they are. Yep. Um, you know, she was a college age athlete, so she probably could get in that position, but she might not have been able to. And so sometimes you can grade the exposure to getting down on the mat into that full position by, you know, just kind of either bringing the hands back towards the feet a bit or putting them up on blocks so she doesn't have to lengthen as much. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And once again here, you know, just uh, you know, changing the context and uh, you know, changing the context changes the experience. And I should put there in bold changes the brain <laughs> because that's really what we're trying to do here. And uh, you can call it distraction. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, you know, we have some Pilates equipment. She got on and, and did some, uh, you know, sort of roll downs with left rotation. And this is meaningful for her. You know, if I gave her, you know, deep neck flexor work and got her prone on a Swiss ball doing scap, not so meaningful for her. You need to make the, the program uh, meaningful and challenging. Uh, you know, she's an athlete. You know, she, these people, the, the, and she had the time. The, you know, not that you know athletes are more motivated; that they're not. But this girl wanted to play softball. She absolutely wanted to get back. So I think increasing the challenge as you go on, while still incorporating their meaningful movement, is important. And so this is a good one. I love this picture. How, this is what she needs to do. Right? She needs to do this. How do you do this? Get her to do this. And, tr and get her neck to rotate and look down better. Mm -hmm. So this is a lot, a lot going on on this slide. But uh, these, uh, this is what she needs to do. And this up in the upper right here, she needs to hit the ball. So you really need positive transference to performance. You know, you really need to transfer these skills. So, uh, you know, standing up and looking down and standing up and turning your head is way different than catching you know, in, in a half kneel position and looking down. The, you will engage certain uh, movement patterns that may not be optimal or they may be fine, but you need to get these patients in, these, in, in the positions that they need to get into. That's meaningful. I keep using that word. That's meaningful for her. So you could get her into a half kneel mm -hmm. position, which I did have her lift a little dowel to get that, that, that upper thorax control um, to vertically load her. This is a great one in kneeling and throwing. 
you know, throwing a medicine ball. She has to do this. Uh, you know, she has to obviously throw. That would be next. You would add rotation next, right? Mm -hmm. So in this upper right-hand corner, she needs to hit the ball. Look at this lunge position. This is relative left rotation. It's the same position almost. So my, and once again, you need to, you know, you really need to cue and give them and give her imagery. So I, I think the point here is really challenge them in full body movement that where you can still train her, train her scalp control and train her upper, her, her upper thoracic control. I mean, you don't just, you know, treat the neck and say, see you later. You need to really, once again, it comes back to what is the driver and how can you train that driver in different positions? Right. And I think it's important to know, especially why we're talking about the upper quarter and Erica bringing in the lower quarter, is that if you think about it, I think the statistics are something like 60 to 70 percent of the power that you have in your upper quarter comes from your lower quarter. Yeah. You know, you have in order to swing that bat with any kind of accuracy and any kind of power, if you don't have the lower quarter coordinated with it and it's not pushing and doing the things that it needs to do, you're going to have a very weak swing. Yeah. You know, the same thing with a throw. That's why, you know, being able to get in these positions brings in that whole reflexive pattern movement that she needs, you know, while Erica's helping her retrain and change her movement system, but she's having, she's having her retrain and change it over these very important types of, um, activities that are going to lead into that meaningful uh, sport. Correct, correct. And I think, um, you know, sometimes, you know, we discharge patients a little too soon, I think, especially if they have to, we don't incorporate the full body. And this is the yeah. whole person, whole body. And you need to load the system. I mean, seriously, you need, it, it, whether they're an athlete or not, they have to pick up children. They have they they have to pick up lawn. They have to lift. And I think uh, it, it's it's just your creativity. It, it's it's it was fun. I enjoyed working with her quite a bit actually. It was a lot of mm -hmm. fun. And uh, this is just a video. Let me see if it's going to play. Um, these are just uh, some other things that I did. Uh, just you know, she's a little bit too close to the wall, but just going in and just moving a ball up and down on the wall. That'll train. That's a bit an easier exercise early on that that you can give the um your patient and that trains that 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 control and the same thing here this is more of a uh just a basic wall and once again easy you know sort of easy early on exercises mm -hmm. and you would cue and give them imagery here um and this actually is not a video i just uh, took a screenshot um uh same thing you know the train these push muscles what are your push muscles you know you're pushing so get her in a half kneel that's how she's in a squat or excuse me that's how she catches get her in a half kneel and just do some get a cable and just do some pushing, do some reaching. Uh, th those, those are, that's how you really train the control across all movements and open and closed chain. You need to, even if they have neck pain, you need to train closed chain as well as open chain, upper and lower extremity, mm -hmm. right? Right. All righty. Uh, this is, I believe, our last slide. Um, and this is a very advanced, very hard movement uh, to do. And once again, it's just push. You need, they just push. Um, she's wrote uh, right up to the end. <laughs> you're, you're, you know, you're going in that, that, that sidearm plank and you're turning that head to the left. Okay. So, uh, and, and, and this is a much more, more of a higher, lo a higher load movement, but I just think that you need, once again, you need to take the patient through the full program, even if they're feeling, you know, good, you need to challenge them because I guarantee you they're going to come back in three months when they run a marathon or they've started a push-up program they're going to come back with a similar issue you need to really mm -hmm. push them through so thank you so much for listening to the webinar uh susan and i really truly hope that, that you enjoyed it and and learn and, and learn some things uh if you have any questions do not hesitate to re reach out our emails are susan at embody-pt.com and mine is email01 at icloud.com and most importantly our website tough Com. We've got some great clinical pearls on there and we'd love for you to go to the website and sign up for our newsletter. Once you sign up, we will send to you immediately a clinical pearls PDF that I have written and some great research on sleep and persistent pain that Susan has written. And secondly, we're having an ongoing mastermind series. Mm -hmm. Go to our website, toughtotreat.com, sign up for the, uh, the ongoing mastermind series that will start again in the fall of 2020. And thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.